Yeah, so let's get into it. Uh, first of all, this license is license for CC by SA, Creative Commons, like basically everything that I do. Um, also, important note, I'm not a hacker. Um, I just did a few projects here and there um, because it's fun. But if someone has any improvements, do let me know or things that, yeah, new ideas. So the first project that I'd like to talk about is uh, this one. Um, this is about some websites that the CIA made uh, around 2010. Um, and they were used for their assets, you know, the people that they recruited or coerced in target countries like Iran and China to spy on those countries. These were the websites that those people would uh, give what they spied back to the CIA, the, the data. Um, and those were exposed and this is what I'm going to be talking about. And one of them was Star Wars themed, which is kind of cool. Um, it, this is how I met uh, with, tech pe with tech people, the organizers of this, this event, because it went to Hacker News. And as we mentioned in the intro, I really liked their ethos. And yeah, so I'm really glad to be talking about this here. Um, right, so before those websites were uncovered, uh, we had heard uh, like rumors that you know many many uh, CIA agents in China had been caught. So this 2018 article was a, a major uh, thing, but we didn't know how. Some there was they're starting to emerge that there, some websites was compromised, some public websites were, were compromised, but we didn't know any examples. So when I heard about this, I'm interested in Chinese politics. Um, I even said, oh. Do we know any of them? I even asked on Quora, you know, and Chris, engineer and former uh, technician at the US Navy said, you're dumb. They're obviously, obviously, the CIA is so smart, they would never leak their websites. Well, Chris, fast forward to 2022, uh, and an article emerged with a few links. So I only heard about this in 2023. Um, I was browsing YouTube and this video popped up from uh, Darknet Diaries. I didn't watch the video, I just clicked the link and uh, that's it. So it's a Rogers article where some of the ex-spies were complaining that the CIA didn't treat them well. <laughs> um, they're just, yeah, like the CIA used us and dumped us, this kind of stuff. And they gave a few websites of the websites. Um, this is an example of the, one of the websites that was used this is a reconstruction from the writer's article. Uh, but as you'd expect, you know, there's a, a login field where the agent would go and type a password and would you know, use an encryption to talk to the CIA. Um, this is by writers. But writers only gave two URLs directly on the article, but they also gave like seven or eight uh, screenshots in total. And um, from those screenshots, it was rather easy to find out the, all the domains, the seven or eight domain names, because either they were like on the title of the page, this is one of the pages, or if you inspected the, the page's source, like the URL for the images had the, you know, the, the, the website. So this activegaminginfo.com, this Chinese website, was one of the websites. So they basically gave away seven or eight websites. But they also said that, uh, they had found uh, upwards of 350 or 800 or something like that websites. And when I read that, I was like, oh, it would be cool if you could find a bunch of them, right? But they didn't disclose them because, you know, they didn't want to cause trouble to the to the agents. But I said, okay, I'm gonna try anyways, it's been 10 years, let's do it. Um, all right. The coolest things that I found on this project, I'm just gonna give them up straight away are one, the Star Wars website. <laughs> that was pretty awesome because most of the websites are extremely boring and uh, this one and they don't have like uh, pop culture references like this. Uh, the Rogers article basically gave all of, the, all of those that had pop, pop culture references, but they missed this one and I'm really, really glad because I'm the one to reveal it. So this is awesome. Um, and the other cool thing and much more serious is the USA spying on its allies. Um, by allies, I mean democracies, which we know, of course, are not really allies. <laughs> but yeah, 
So for example, Brazil. And we know which country those websites target because of the language. Some languages could be many countries, but our language could only be one country. For example, Brazilian Portuguese, they are spying in Brazil. Snowden had already talked about this and there are many other relations. We know they spied in Brazil, but it's really cool that, you know, you get this uh, way back machine uh, image. You know, you have an actual link. You can see it you know, live on the on this link in the Wayback, Wayback machine and you can see the website more or less as it was. So that's kind of cool. Um, Germany, Dedrick Online. I don't speak Germany, German, but it's German. Uh, France, Le Sumum de la Finance. I speak French. Uh, Italy, Attività Estreme and many other democracies. So it's kind of cool. Um, okay, so now I'll just talk a little bit about how I've, I found those, the new websites that are not given by Rogers. Um, right, so the first and easy thing was they use sequential IPs <laughs> for the websites and Reuters themselves mentioned that. Uh, so from that, it's quite easy to find other websites. It's just a, a question of, you know, how good is your data? Because the websites are down now, so it has to be historic data, and you have to search a bit. And the first website that I found some, you know, easily accessible on the web browser historic data was this one, viewdns.info. It's not complete by any means. I, I pieced data from many sources. But this one was the easiest one to use, and the first one I found on Google, and I, I found some new domains, and I was quite excited. This is what started me. So basically, I, I took like activegaminginfo.com, one of those those websites, right? And so if you go there, you can do an IP history, and you can see oh for this domain, what are the all the IPs that have been served on that domain? Yeah, yes, that have served that domain. And so here we found out oh, 2012, this is one of the IPs that served that, that domain. 2024, I don't care, 2012, yeah, that's the one. And then if you take that IP, there's another tool which searches, you know, for this IP, what are all the domains that have been historically hosted on that IP? And if you search, you know, one by one, I did it manually to start it on the browser, but then they have an API, you can find, you know, uh, try to find other nearby IPs. And that's how I find my first hits. So here, for example, you know, on a nearby IP like 149, this was the 148, so the next one had a likely hit. And then if you take the domain name, you can go on Wayback Machine and you can see, you know, oh, and you can confirm ah, this is, has some similarities with the others, so it's definitely a hit. Um, the problem with the Way Wayback Machine is that you have to have the domain name. Uh, they don't have any IP exposed. They have the data, but they don't expose it. Um, so we have to do other sources to find the domains. Okay, so that was the easy part. Uh, depends on the definition, definition of easy, but relatively easy. Um, the hard part is finding new IP ranges. Um, and then I, res I tried a bunch of random stuff. I, yeah, if anyone has any ideas, do let me know. But the first way I found new hits on new ranges was through the 2013 DNS census, which is well published on this random uh, new sites website. Um, and it's very likely, it was very likely to obtain via an illegal botnet because it's quite similar to a uh, 2012 uh, botnet dump like this. It was so some guy hacked a bunch of routers and then instead of using them to do something evil, the guy used them to explore the, the net, you know, and publish the data publicly, which is amazing. This guy is, is awesome, but it's unknown who, who, who publishes this anonymous. And their data looks like this, as you'd expect. You know, I just took some well-known domains, but they have a bunch of domains, not not just one. They, they really went, you know, for all each IPv4, they were pinging every single IPv4 ever. Because IPv4, you could do that still with a botnet. And just selecting a few well-known domains, so Amazon.com on this date was served at this IP. You know, and they have that for all the they could find. Then I took that, I dumped it into, into SQLite which is, you know, local SQL database, which I love so much, it's so cool. And started mining that and trying to find new domains. One of the, yeah, so one of the main things that helps, so the part of the fingerprint, you know, like the, that you, to help identify the sites, was that 
the CIE use exclusively almost um, dedicated servers. So you have one site per IP. And this is the case for not many websites, at least nowadays. At the time, I'm not sure, but at the time, I think too. Um, it, like they were a minority, so that makes it easier to find them, you know? So yeah, so with these data sets, you can, you, you have to search, oh, let's see which IP only has one domain. So that narrows things down a bit. So this is one of the things that I used. Um, the other thing that I used, which was very important, was the Webback Machine API. Um, they don't, so those websites, they had four communication mechanisms, which I understood by looking more and more of them. So you know, JAR, Adobe Flash, JavaScript, HTTPS. Uh, yes, HTTPS, <laughs> it's true. Um, and each one of those has certain URL patterns on, on the path, you know, the path part of the URL, that, you know, that's how they communicate. And so the Wayback Machine, you cannot search, you know, across domains, which is a shame. You can only search for this domain, does it have this path? So you need to have a big domain list. But, you know, by using heuristics, I started narrowing down a bit and I managed to find a few others. And then I noticed, oh, the Wayback Machine does not block Tor. So I said, okay, I scripted 100 Tor IPs to speed, speed things up when I react. Uh, that helped a lot. Um, and so that helped me find, you know, you just, you're basically, there's a funnel, you know, and you start narrowing down uh, to more and more likely hits. And then you just looked at them manually at some point. That's how it works, the process. Um, and the other thing which was major <laughs> and is very cheeky and very heuristic is it contains, the domains have a lot of news on them. They really screwed up on that one. Um, so one third, about one third of the hits contains the word news on the domain name. Uh, and I used that heuristic and it was extremely <laughs> effective. Um, so these are some of the main ideas that I used, you know. Another cool data source that I used was, um, I'd, oh no, so when I started finding some new hits, I always put them on Google, you know, from time to time and see if other websites, you know, have that domain because they might have other of the hits, right? And I started noticing they're quite rare, those hits, but there's quite a few that appeared on Chinese expired domain trackers, which are websites that track, you know, for this date, you know, 2012, March 6th, those domains expired. I think the goal of this web, those websites is like for commercial go, commercial users uh, to, you know, sell the domains afterwards, good domains afterwards. But I use them for myself as well. They were highly throttled, but with some patience, I scraped them all and I put it on GitHub. So, you know, another little data set and contribution to the community, which is kind of cool. And yes, finally, like I said, I'm not a, an expert on any of this. I just do go and try stuff out. If you have any data sources, which you know, historic data sources, because those websites are down now. So historic data so sources or any ideas of through the print fingerprints, do let me know. If you find something, you will be extremely clearly credited on the article and on Twitter. So yeah, so that's it for this project. Um, all right, let's hop on to the next one. Uh, so the CIA thing was like a very much on the side thing that was like for fun in the evenings, weekends, and for a few weeks. And that was it. That was kind of, kind of punctual. Uh, this is a bit more longer term and more useful, perhaps. Uh, less fun, but more useful. Linux kernel module cheat. This is the, the link for it. Um, and GitHub project. Oh, where is it? Click the wrong key. Okay, I'm not used to this keyboard, sorry. So GitHub project, yeah. And the goal of this project is to have the perfect emulation setup. So you run Linux on a virtual machine to understand and debug it. Uh, and it can be very useful, for, from what I've heard, for security people to try to reverse, you know, uh, re reverse things. Um, right, and so, how does it work? I run, my goal is to make this easy to run things on QMU. Uh, QMU is a simulator, it runs very fast and it's very cool. 
So first you run some random commands, like these are the commands, and this basically gives you, gives you a Docker. I've just tested it on Ubuntu 24.04. And after you get this Docker, once you reach the point, everything will work for sure because you're in Docker, right? Hopefully. Uh, so after you reach that point, you run this command. This builds everything from source. So QMU, Linux kernel, GDPC, shell, blah, 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 everything. And then you do run. And after you do run, Linux boots, and you end up in a shell. No, so here I run pwd command. So uh, a Linux shell provided by a uh, uh, build root uh, shell thingy. Uh, busy box they use okay so far it's not too exciting but what is exciting about this in my opinion is that everything is built from source and i mean everything there there are no blobs so kim is built from source linux kernel is built from source glibc gcc everything is built from source so it's extremely clean and for the most important projects i even have them as sub modules of my project so you can just, you know, you have them, git tracked, all the sources there, and yeah, uh, it, it's, you can just modify things very easily. So for example, do you want to modify Linux kernel? No problem. You go to this function, if you want to say you want to modify the start kernel function, which runs at boot time, let's put a print there, then you do build Linux, then you do run, and there it is, you know, it will show up there, this build was really fast because it was a differential build. So, you know, you can see that you can really modify things. Another really cool thing about having the source lying around is that we can use GDB step debugging very easily. Uh, so for example, if you wanted to GDB step debug Linux kernel, and let's say you want to debug the start kernel function now, instead of just putting a print, that we want to put GDB there, uh, we can. So you just run, run GDB wait, we to be start kernel with another shell and after boot which is really fast on keyboard just a few seconds bang you know you get a, a gdb shell and you can do common gdb things like you know go to the next line list bt everything basically just works so this is really cool multiple architectures are supported so if you want to change the architecture super easy you know just say oh the architecture is AX64 and now run the architecture AX64 and it also just works. And I also have a lot of you know more content oriented things in this repo because I use it whenever I want to test something or learn something, I just that is related to emulation, you know, I just dumped it there. So okay, I have kernel modules as the name indicates about the project. Uh, you know, for example, hello.c is a is a kernel module, and you can just know. Just like news kernel, just build, we run, and bam, there it is. I also learned a lot of assembly through this project. So I made minimal uh, examples. For for example, here I have you know this. Let's let's learn the add instruction of x86, for example. So it's, it's a one plus one equals three assertion. This is just a new journal example, but because you need emulation basically to learn assembly, this is a very convenient to put everything in this one place and just run it there, you know, and it's very clean and yeah. And another thing that I did in this project as well is uh, even bare metal, <laughs> because of course this is unrelated to Linux kernel, but it was kind of cool and also emulation focused. So I also have some bare metal examples that, yeah, you can run bare metal features as well. So yeah, this is a more useful project. Uh, yeah, and, and I think it's quite convenient and yeah, might be useful for security people. Okay. All right, on to the next project, rbbook.com, also known as the rbbook project. Um, this is kind of what I'm working on full time right now. This is the logo of the project. This is the project on GitHub, like everything else that I do, basically. Um, this is an introduction video, which you should watch. Um, in March of this year, someone gave me a thousand Monero to work on this project. And this is just kind of a incremental thing that like 
someone gives you a little bit of money and then you start saying, oh, if you give me more money, I'll do that. And then they give a little bit more and you say, oh, if you give me more money, and you reach that point, I say, okay, if I have $100,000, I'll work on this, I'll quit my job and work on this for one year. And some crazy Monero person, uh, as an anonymous cryptocurrency, gave it to me. I have no idea who it is. It is anonymous. Here is my wallet when the guy gave it to me. Here is me making a reaction video <laughs> to thank the, the person. And this is how it feels like, because, you know, I received an anonymous money and I quit my job for a year. But here we are. So it's crazy. Okay, so someone gave me money. Maybe there's something there, right? Maybe not. But, okay. So what is the motivation for this project? So the big picture, university sucks so bad right now. And education in general, I feel it's terrible. Because after the internet, the old system doesn't make any sense anymore. It's, it's too inefficient. We can do so much better, right? Um, so, yeah, it, where it's just too boring, too slow, too expensive, we can do much better. How to do it? Of course, a different question. There's a lot of inertia in the system. But the first step that I'm trying to do is to get the students to write what they learn and to make all the knowledge free. Um, this, is, I think, is the easiest part of this equation and the one I'm tackling first. Um, all right, so a bit more concretely, if you decide to use the RB book project, what do you get? Um, okay, so in simple terms, every user gets one big, big table of contents uh, where they can put everything that they have ever learned, hopefully. Uh, so for example, this is my, my profile on rbook.com dot slash Um This is my big table of contents. I have 10,000 articles, mostly, most of them empty placeholders, but I have 10,000 articles. Um, so this is just an example of my homepage and how yours might look like. You can have infinitely deep table of contents, you know, there, there's no limits like H6, like HTML only goes up to H6. Now we have, you know, you can go 50, 40, 100, doesn't matter. So here we have an example of a taxonomy and goes really deep. So far, nothing too exciting. But the exciting thing, I believe, and this is the major innovation, the whole goal of this project kind of, is the topics feature, which allows you to, if someone writes another article with the same title as yours, essentially, you can easily see, you know, all the articles that have that, that title. So if you're reading, you know, my mathematics tutorial and you come across the derivative section and that one is not very clear, you can click a button and see, oh, let's see what other people wrote about that subject, sorted by a vote, which is a bit what Stack Overflow Stack Exchange does. Right, so a bit towards that. So trying to merge the knowledge of multiple people, which is a bit of what Stack Overflow and Wikipedia do. I'll, I'll compare more of those websites in a bit. But this is, I believe, the major innovation of my system. Uh, and on top of that, I have to try and make things easy to edit and publish as much as possible. Um, yeah, I, it's very hard work. I, I do as much as I can, and but so a few I do things that are important to me. For example, the links are amazing. I believe this is the correct way to make links. So if you want to link to something, you know you don't have to write this file name. You just write the thing itself, and that's it. So you, know, you don't have to say calculus, Hibbert, just Hibbert space, just links directly to any header in other files. Just an example of the things that, you know, is likely innovative. Um, more in terms of editing, I have, so you can, you can edit directly on rbbook.com. There's a side-by-side a, a -side editor or live preview. But you can also edit the source locally. So I have this, you know, like the markup language, which is a bit like Markdown, and you can edit those files locally, and then you can publish them in two ways, which is kind of cool. So you can either publish them as a static website, or you can publish them to rbbook.com, and they look quite similar. You know, so for example, this is my homepage, searchlink.com, and this. And this is my homepage on rbbook.com. 
but one is a static website and the other is a dynamic website. So one uh, doesn't have multi user features, it's just me, and the other has all those amazing features that I just mentioned, like topics and so on. But the cool thing is that you get the static website. So if rbook.com broke, you still have your website forever as a static website, but it's not going to break, I promise. Um, so I have a Visual Studio Code extension, which was very recently delisted from Visual Studio Code Marketplace, and they refused to explain why. Uh, I'll see if they answer more clearly, but I uploaded the, a file that you can install. I swear to you, there are no viruses <laughs> on my reputation. Um, and, you know, it, it has basically parity with markdown editing. Plus, yeah, so for example, you get tables of contents and this kind of stuff for the RBBook markup. Okay, so comparing RBBook to other things that have come to mind and which are definitely major inspirations for me. So one of them, oh, how does it compare to Wikipedia? I believe it's not possible to learn mathematics and physics from Wikipedia. You can get a few ideas and it's very useful, but you know, if you wanna really learn the subject, I do not believe it's possible. And I think I know why. And I think I, I, I work around it. So a few reasons are, for example, you get no uh, reputation points or no indication of your contribution. You just go into a huge list of your thousands of people and you get completely forgotten. And this Stack Overflow does very well. You get points, you know. This is fundamental. Just an example. Uh, the other problem is that people can delete your stuff at any time and you have to fight in complex systems with them, you know, like uh, edit wars and so on. And, you know, if you just spent four hours writing an amazing tutorial and someone just goes and deletes it, 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 it doesn't work, right? So we avoid those points. We're a bit more like Stack Overflow in that sense that it's your answer, no one else can edit it, basically. So why not Stack Overflow then? Why doesn't physics stack exchange or mathematics stack exchange solve mathematics and physics? And I believe a fundamental thing they're missing is that you cannot make a book on them. Right? You can only answer specific questions. You can ask a question and answer it yourself, but you cannot have a table of content, contents and like good context around it, you know. Also moderation issues that everything gets deleted, but yeah, the, you don't have a table of contents. I think that's what I try to add it to the table. And the other thing that you might compare it to uh, are other personal knowledge bases like Obsidian uh, and so on. And the problem with those, first, they do not merge people's brains, which is something that Stack Overflow and Wikipedia do in RB book. But this is fundamental, right? You want something that scales to merge people's ideas together in a cohesive way. And some of them don't even have publishing. <laughs> you know, they're just like for you to organize your personal knowledge base which is cool, but you know, I wanna solve public knowledge as a whole. So this is how I think it compares. I'm trying, I don't have many users right now, but I do believe it only takes a small number of smart people, of smart university students to write a lot, you know, and make a big impact. So stay tuned, you know, maybe something will happen. I'm trying it out right now. All right, on to the next project. <laughs> um, the next project is this one, uh, my inscription, Bitcoin inscription museum. So at some point I started, I learned that uh, you can write arbitrary data into the Bitcoin blockchain and non-financial data. For example, images and text. And that's kind of cool, right? Because the Bitcoin blockchain is di distributed through many, many people. So it's very hard to delete the data. So the question that comes to mind then is, you know, how illegal does something have to be for some government to say Bitcoin is illegal in this country, right? How illegal does it have to be? Are Peter Web memes enough, illegal enough? I don't know. What about nuclear weapon designs? This is from Reddit, by the way, and it's all speculation. CIA, don't come after me. What about political memes? What if you post a Tankman meme in China on the Bitcoin blockchain? Does they like it? Um, so this is the fundamental question. I don't think anything is illegal enough. <laughs> you know, 
either there is always a better way to find the illegal things or you know your your enemies have already saved any any leaks that happen in their servers and it's already too late so i don't think any to ever get banned but this inspiration led me to you know really investigate things a bit and it's just kind of cool what i found you know not necessarily legal things but just people so in 2022 so bitcoin started 2009 in 2022 uh this ordinal rusat inscription is a, a protocol for writing stuff on the blockchain was created and it became really really popular so as you can see here uh, nowadays there are more than 500 400 thousands of such inscriptions which are mostly images so at this point it's like you cannot see all of them so it's kind of pointless but on the earlier days when the bitcoin is less popular there are way way fewer images right and so my kind of obsession has been <clears throat> i want to find all the images all of them which kind of means searching in many heuristic ways uh, the blockchain and trying to find you know because maybe there's, there's multiple ways that you can encode things and is, is it the raw png is it the base 64 and so on so it's hard to find all of them but i'm getting close i think of the older ones uh so and just cool because i saw what people put in there and i appreciated it you know not the legal there, there was almost nothing illegal and a lot of fun things so basically social media it's basically what they use it for so fun tributes like a magic the gathering web a trading card game a card ascii art um, these are just two friends and they created one of the, the earliest protocol basically for upload and is, one of them is really cool uh and they re, re, replies on twitter and it's really nice it was just cool you not know, to, to see what those people are doing in the early days it's like artistic you know so art so this is an, also an upload by envy and so in this upload this is the work that he created himself a photographer that he created himself he just found like a little art of a robot on the street and took a picture of it and put it on bitcoin blockchain but the idea behind it is that you know this robot will disappear but this image will stay in the blockchain forever you know so the art is a bit beyond um just the image is where it is placed it's placed on the bitcoin blockchain this adds a context to it it's kind of cool i'm not an artist but i could appreciate it you know stupid memes <laughs> of course part of social media love declarations so this one has a a novel chinese poem so a western man married a chinese woman kind of cool and ads of course ads right so this one i selected for this talk is there's this conference jr conference which i did not know about previously but i don't know much about hacking and he said oh your free jr con ticket code oh but where is it and then at some point i noticed oh we should remove the ad signs because there's a bunch of ad signs it becomes much clearer you know off return is your friend so when i saw this i was like oh, oh, oh. it's cool it's like a little obf obfuscation puzzle and yeah so it was really fun to explore these kind of things and yeah have a look it's also on my website uh, the links up here da -da 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 -da. yes so there's a link here cool next part China dictatorship. Uh, all right. Hmm. So, what is this project? I. It's on. It's on GitHub and many other places. The basic idea is this. This is Xi Jinping, the ruler of China, dictator or president, depending on how you prefer to call him. This is Xi Jinping wearing a sadomasochist, sadomasochist leather suit. It might be a Photoshop, or it might not be a Photoshop. But that is beyond the point of the matter. So, what is cool about certain websites is that because we're using HTTPS, the sensor, Mr. Xi Jinping, cannot know which path we're accessing, right? So, if I publish this image, which I have on GitHub, and a Chinese person is accessing the internet and going through Mr. Xi Jinping, Mr. Xi Jinping cannot know if they are accessing an extremely important open source project, such as TensorFlow, or if they are accessing Chinese dictatorship to look at Xi Jinping memes. This is because of HTTPS. 
So this makes GitHub the perfect place to post political Chinese political propaganda because if they block it, they'll lose access to TensorFlow. Sure, they can clone it elsewhere, elsewhere, but they cannot contribute back to it, right? Which is the the, the value of open source. So this puts them in a very very difficult dilemma. And it's kind of cool because China really has a lot of loss of supporters, <laughs> and some of them really go on the tracker and say very very nice things to me, uh, like you idiot author, and I translate all of them because it's fun. Taiwanese maggot, I'm not Taiwanese. Go away. Ah. Oh. This one, Bao said, it's just you guys who have made GitHub a mess. So they say, oh no, you cannot use GitHub for this. But of course, GitHub is the perfect place for this in other programming websites. For example, Stack Overflow. Now I'm not using this anymore on Stack Overflow because I have very limited you know, propaganda space and I'm using it for RB book. But in the past, I was using it on Stack Overflow. So for example, if you add it to your domain, to your, to your, to your name, you know, it appears on every page that you have ever commented and answered, right? It could be a lot of important questions and answers that have been affected. So here, for example, this big question, I have a comment and another comment, a big, a lots of up up upvotes, and it will be visible forever. You know, so, so you start reaching out to lots of pages. Another place that I have a, put this a little bit is in package, packaging managers. So I dumped the, the text of that repository on, on various packages. And some of them stay up, and st some of the st some of them stay down. And this way, you you it's kind of a test of the morals of the people who maintain those websites, right? So this is an example where it was taken down. So Pipe is the package manager thing for, for Python. I had it there for many years, and then in 2013, some Chinese person likely reported it, and they did take it down. So you know, so they are on the bad side of morals. But it's cool to test this. You know. And sometimes the bad things happen, like they took down the RB book VS Code extension very recently. So I'll try to sort that out. Okay, so I and quick no mention why I'm doing this project. Uh, yeah, so I, I married a Chinese woman and her mother does uh, a religion that's forbidden in China. So there's a very personal side to it, but also because of, yeah, I hate datorships and yeah, it's they're really bad for, for the world. So this is one of the cool things that I I think them kind of very, very on the side type of thing. All right. Um, next project. Um, so this one was a really, really quick one, but that had quite a, a punch effect to it. Um, I, was, I, I play a lot of GitHub and try to hack it a little bit. I never managed to find anything uh, just on the side for fun. But this one, I like, there is this website, um, what's the name of the project? Oh, I didn't write it down. But there is a project by Google which was like putting all the GitHub data on a big query, uh, like data source. And that allows you to, you know, query the data more efficiently than what the GitHub APIs allow for. And one of the things that they were indexing were comments. So they had on this SQL like database a list of all the comments ever made on github <laughs> and they include the emails of the committers you know because when you do a git commit you usually add your email there right but most people don't think that this will be become public but but of course it must become public because if someone clones your repo they can then read it right but cloning other repos would be very inefficient and slow but with this and this query i could get all of them <laughs> in like a few seconds you know? so it was like millions of emails and then as i also do i just dump them all on github and it was quite fun to see you know github as a analytics tracker which says who's linking back to you and i could just see all types of companies saying oh your email is leaked of course i was writing a commit a long time ago you know but all this activity and lots of lots of hit 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 and github put at me and say no take it down so Yes, so the repo is still up, but data was taken down, um, which is sad. And it's kind of like, sh it's public data, right? So why, why do you have taken down? But what can you do? So, but it was kind of fun. So it was, and after that, what they did was, now they hashed all those emails. So this, this 
project still exists, but they, they hashed all the emails, so you cannot know, know what they are. I just one way while it lasted. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, there are a few other projects that I did, but they're smaller. Um, yeah, this was kind of cool. Um, I can mention real quick, which is Facebook profiled face dump. Um, so in the past, Facebook had like sequential profiles. So you had like username, plus one, two, three, four, five, blah, blah, blah. And the images of those profiles, they had no authentication. So you could just, you know, loop over all of them sequentially and get a bunch of faces, <laughs> um, which is really bad for privacy. But that's what I did. And then I made some videos and put them on YouTube and then YouTube didn't like that and took them down. But yeah, so the lesson is don't use you know, huge sequential publicly accessible things with facial data. Of course, the secret services have already mined all of this to death, but yeah, hackers will do it as well. Um, okay, these are kind of all the projects. Um, can we open up for questions? Um, I thought it would take longer, but I kind of went very quickly through it. Okay. Oh. Okay, okay. So um, let's have some questions. If you uh, let me just tell people in chat, right? Uh, todos vocês que estiverem assistindo aí a palestra, se quiserem fazer perguntas, é, esse é o momento. Uh, pode perguntar em português, que a gente traduz para o inglês. Lembrando que vai ter a, a, o, o Ciro fala português, obviamente também. É, então podem ficar à vontade para perguntar. É, só um aviso antes, é, a gente está com o nosso amigo Titânio agora, aqui na, na, na live com a gente, o nosso, o nosso querido Zetsu teve um problema técnico na sua casa, então a gente trouxe aí o, o nosso mestre Titânio para estar tá substituindo ele. Dali. É, alguém, alguém quer fazer pergunta? Hã? Bom, tem um, um agradecimento aqui do Julio, né? Uh, há quatro anos atrás você respondeu no Reddit uma dúvida que eu tinha sobre um problema de compilação do kernel, desde lá sou muito grato pela sua existência, te amo Ciro Santilli oh, Reddit. Yes. <risos> valeu, valeu. <risos> uh, nice project with a forum, if I want to create a new post on it, does it need to be a technical content to be accepted on the forum or can I can I post about anything? Anything. Anything that's legal. <laughs> the definition of legal <laughs> is complex, but no, but I want it to be extremely broad, as broad as the law allows me to do it. I myself have posted endless amounts of uh, non-technical things. And yes, that's a very important part of philosophy and it's very clearly stated everywhere. So you can post about anything that's legal. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, Cabal asks for the link of the article you were showing at our big book. Qual artigo, Lúcia? Enquanto isso, enquanto ele não responde, I would like to make a, uh, a question. I read your like a biography, let's say that, uh, and I saw that you um, were a guitar player. Now, I am myself a guitar player. And I've been getting into <laughs> jazz fusion stuff. Now I just find out about this band Cassiopeia. Do, do you know Japanese? A, a uh, little bit. A little bit. So I, I, I'm not a guitar player. This is I, I used to okay. play when I was a teenager. A little bit. And yeah. Okay. I wanted to ask you: uh, Do you think that your your studies at music have helped you somehow in your journey as a in university or with our big book or no it it was just a, a... yeah th th these things are extremely hard to know for sure but i think they, they it was the opposite they 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 were wor they made me worse <laughs> okay but, 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 but like I, it's impossible to answer but basically like um i was kind of passionate about this and i was putting energy into that but you know, I, I don't use it at all now. I think maybe okay. it changed my brain, 
but generally to be successful is the more focus you have more like the more likely you su to succeed um, yes for sure yeah <laughs> but i'm very happy that you, yeah, i can appreciate the music and that's cool so it's hard to answer here Thank you. It's okay. Uh, Luz Cabal said uh, the one you wrote for the talk. So he wants the link of the article for the talk. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure how to write messages to people. Uh, it's on the screen right now. Uh, and let's do posts. Uh, so these are these are links that I'm posting right now. Yeah, so they're either one of those. And yes, yeah, so do, you should let me know where how to answer or post them or organizers can also share them. Yes. Uh, Oh, okay, so your screen is not alive anymore, uh, but our friend Biscoito, if you if you do you have access to private chat, right? On StreamYard. No. Well, we we'll get the link if it's on the top right. Private chat. Yes. Yes. Yo, Ciro, I got a question for you. The person asked me, told me to ask you in Portuguese. Okay. Você tem algo para passar para os brasileiros que estão assistindo, além de aprender inglês? <laughs> ok. Esse é o mais importante. <laughs> Porque as outras coisas não tem nada de específico para o Brasil, né? Tipo... É, em, em geral, o que eu tento é fazer sempre coisas que têm impacto global. Então, é, é uma questão muito difícil de responder, né? Tem, mas, é, em geral, as coisas de hacking são iguais para todo mundo, mais ou menos, né? Então, em geral, eu tentaria sempre ter impacto global, quer dizer, em inglês. Os, os outros conselhos são as, as outras coisas mais genéricas, né? Que não seria específicos brasileiros. Uh, é. Uh, I have a question on, so I'm, I'm sure you are aware that now in Brazil, X has been, um, I don't want to say censored. I'm just going to say, um, it's down. It's, it's not among us anymore. So, um, do you have any opinions on that? Okay. So I've only read this very, very briefly, like okay. nothing about it, but my opinions are two, one. You can you should not block VPN access because they're finding VPN access to it. Yeah, they, they they try to find a VPN access, but they they kind of draw draw that back, you know. Okay, so that is that they should never ever ever do. Then it becomes China. Opinion number two is this is not only for Brazil but for all democracies. We need more direct democracy. We need to be, make it very easy for people to vote on questions like this, like should ban X or not, and then the whole country just goes Poof, and says no or yes, I don't know. Uh, so. Those are my two thoughts on that. Yeah. Uh, Julio is asking, Ciro, how was your process of leaving Brazil? Okay. Uh, first, you go to uh, uh, USP in university. Um, then I did well. Uh, well yeah. yeah, I did well. <laughs> um, get, get the grades. And then I applied for foreign programs. Uh, which they had, uh, and the best ones are in France, I think. And yeah, they accepted me on, on the French one. It was kind of crazy. I'm not sure if I deserve it, but that's kind of how I left. But yeah, now they're kind of going back on that program and they ha don't have so many links anymore. So yeah, kind of, there are other paths and I've met people of other paths, but there are basically two paths you're gonna leave Brazil go to a top university and then go abroad to do a PhD or undergrad, which means being having a very good grades and being very good in universities, all of which is very boring. Or you can work a few years in Brazil and then go like that. Uh, that's another way which I've seen people do, but you need, you need more experience first, but it's doable. Also, okay. I'm an Italian citizen as well. So that also helps, okay. of course, but it's not essential. I have met many people who are doing very well, who, you know, so that's not essential, but it helps. Uh, I, I actually just... get, have a good question for you. Removing the part of going abroad, was college worth it? Uh, no. 
design <laughs> doing this project. Um, yeah, but I think it's, it's hard to say. At, at least in Brazil, and I think my my universe is, is very good. I, I don't know all, all the artists, but I do think it's very good. People are very good in general, but most people don't like it, and it's you know why, right? Because you have this fixed grade of courses, and teachers have no incentive to. Some teachers are amazing, but there's no incentive for them to do well, right? And uh, that the research, novel research, don't in the matters to them. They're swung to work as well, and underpaid. Um, okay, so what I want to say is, I don't. Yeah, I don't think any university is very good right now. <laughs> you know, um, okay. Okay, that's fair. But it's kind what, of inevitable what? if you want to get good jobs after. But this is why the system is so broken. Um. What did you graduate in? Just to finish on that. Yeah, uh, it was a double degree. So in Brazil, it was okay. automation control, and in France, yeah, and in France, it was applied mathematics. Okay. But I didn't really yeah. learn much of either, like as much as I'd like. Uh, they're also <laughs> subjects, but yes. Yes, yes, but that's really nice. Um, our friend Mac has asked your comments about the Chinese dictatorship have already, like caused you any trouble in some job? Uh, so, uh, this, are, this is very hard to answer. Uh, okay. It was very indirect. Uh, so, for example, I, I was contributing contribute to an open source project as part of my job once. And then mm -hmm. a Chinese guy said, oh, your profile picture on this thing is... No, my profile pictures on all things are that. And, from before I was working on this job. So I do try to separate it, but it can be difficult, right? And companies know that. Uh, so like a Chinese guy commented that on the forum and that led into further inquiries, you know, and it was like a bit, um, but of course this is the, the easy part. The hard part is what you don't know, right? Did they not get hired because of this? The, so I, I'd, I have had good companies so far and I, I'm not, sh I don't think to, they, not major problems but it could. okay but so far i don't think it was uh yeah okay M more questions on pseudo i was the one that f found your blog and shared it with my friends overall i have a great feeling of respect for your work and my question is what are the key points for making a work you do have a uh, work that has global impact Wow. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, like, besides thinking, will this be useful for someone in France, for someone in Africa? Oh, I'm sorry, I feel like I've made a mistake. The question is, well, what are the key points for making uh, your work have global impact, right? É isso que você quer dizer, né, Celezin? Como que ele vai fazer para o trabalho dele ter um impacto global? I think that that's it. No, but I think there's are similar uh, questions, right? Uh, your work okay, or yeah, general, yeah. right? I think there's similar questions, uh, but, but I don't know what else besides, you know, like, yeah, will, will people from other countries be able to use it? You know, um, of course, we want to help Brazil as well, and I want to help Brazil. I don't know how, <laughs> but I want to. Um, yeah, but yeah, I do think lots of things are very reusable, you know, so why, if you're going to make it, just, you know, make it, uh, in all languages, you know, just put variables instead of hard code in Portuguese and then just sell it somewhere else. Let's make, you know, let's make big companies in Brazil, right? Let's, let's make unicorns in Brazil, you know, non-financial, hopefully. But, yeah. Ciro, in your fight against censorship and dictatorship, especially in relation to your posts about China, have you ever suffered reprisals from the Chinese government? No. No, I haven't reached that, okay. that point. I'm, I'm too okay. unknown. Of course, at some... Yeah, I mean... Have, have you ever been to China? No? Yes, before I started this uh, for one month, just to, to travel, yes. But okay. After okay. this, so just... no, it would be very interesting to try. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you should, man, honestly. I have my doubts. <laughs> yeah, I wonder at which point, you know, I would be turned back or uh, held. Um, but yeah. Um, so by the Chinese government, I, 
I think it's, it's too niche, right? Because it only affects programmers, but programmers are extremely important part of the population, right? GDP wise, mm -hmm. um, but it's still extremely niche. Um, but there are no, I think, known cases where foreign uh, people were uh, outside of China directly, like really, okay. really seriously affected. Uh, okay. Yeah, the most likely thing to do is if you work for a company that has no morals, they could fire you. Uh, that's more, much more likely than you know the Chinese government kind of affected. But if you're Chinese, it's a bit different. But yeah. Okay, so just a comment from philosopher Socrates: Zero ever since my friend Salazan shared your blog, okay. I've regained some faith in humanity. So uh, nice words from Socrates. And uh, Math F three asks Zero: If the Chinese government invited you to visit, would you accept? <laughs> 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 yeah, no, I, I don't think so. I think it would be a trap. <laughs> okay. They, they, they will fall. They, they, they will fall. All dictatorships fall. So uh, dictatorships, they're, they're very strong because they do, like, they destroy crime because they are the crime. And they do make good decisions, sometimes better than democracies. But at some point, they get it wrong and then everything just blows up and then they go back to the Middle Ages. So this, uh, yeah. Okay. Um... Do we have time for some more questions or is it? Um, okay, two more questions. Does anybody have? Alguém tem pergunta? Nós vamos fazer mais duas perguntas. And if you have anything else, you can just write on, on my Twitter. I, I reply to everything basically. So, but yeah. Yeah. Siri is a very approachable person, right? This is sex says, we love you, Siri. Please come to Brazil. It, it, it's hard because I want to do tech, <laughs> but I want to bring something back, but I don't oh, have it yet, you know. People are, are asking about uh, books. Do you have any books you recommend for people? I'm not a book person. I just Google things really? until I find them. And if they're in a book, I look for the section in the book. But my, my one of my key philosophies is decide what you want to do. And then Google their way to it, and then go okay. backwards. So backwards design is called. Um, so that's what I my belief is backwards design. Okay. Uh, so one, I would I guess last question, Siru, how do you envision the future of internet freedom? I, I don't know. It's a question of how efficient the decentralization can be, essentially, right? Uh, because centralized servers are so much more efficient. So mm -hmm. I don't have necessarily too much hope. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess that's, that is basically it. If you have, if you have other questions, you can always find Ciro on Twitter or yeah, make and, sure to. Oh, no, I was muted. Actually, Ciro, what if you had it your way? What will be the dream? Future of internet freedom for you? Uh, I mean, we, we all know what, what we want, right? But I think the key problem now is maybe well, one key problem is that our democracies are getting kind of destroyed and people's votes don't do anything, essentially. Um, that's kind of what, what you want for freedom is absolute freedom. <laughs> oh, what happened? Okay, so I guess that's about it. Uh, I just want to say, Siru, thank you so much for your talk here, for your work. Uh, I'm a big fan of our big book. Everybody make sure to, you know, sign up on our big book, read stuff, you know, um, make articles and um, yeah, keep hacking. Cool. Just don't hack our people. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yes, just don't hack people. Cool. Thank you so much for hosting me, okay. guys. Yeah. Cheers. Uh, it was our pleasure. Cheers. Okay. Cheers, Bye -bye. man. Bye. Cara, que pedrada, né? Sinistra. Começou bem a semana da tua. Essa é uma dessas palestras muito únicas, né? Que, sim, é... Você, tem uma, você entra em contato com uma coisa que talvez você nem imaginava, sabe? O, o Siri é um cara muito foda e eu recomendo todo mundo seguir ele. E 
é, é, checar lá o trabalho dele, ok? É, agora já estamos quase chegando às 8 horas, então a gente vai passar para a nossa próxima palestra. Eu só queria rapidinho mandar um salve para o Mano Dev, que mandou uma mensagem no PV aqui. Salve, Mano Dev, eterno mestre. Uh, eu acho que agora a gente pode trazer o Gildácio.